Welcome back to the Early Career Immunology Seminar Series. For those of you returning, thank you for your continued support. The purpose of the seminar series is to increase the exposure of early career faculty in a time which we had not yet achieved equity and representation at scientific conferences and seminars despite equally innovative discoveries. If you sit on an organizing committee for conferences or other seminar series, please consider selecting our fantastic speakers from our current lineup. Uh, today, we're excited to have Wilton Williams. Uh, Wilton did his PhD at the University of Florida before moving on to HIV-1 vaccine development at Duke. His research efforts at Duke have focused on understanding the humor, humoral immune response to candidate HIV-1 vaccines in humans and non-primates, uh, non-human primates. The results of the studies have provided insights into immunogen design and engineering vaccine regimens uh, that will contribute to the development of efficacious HIV-1 vaccine. Wilton has also led immune monitoring of human clinical trials that were the first to implicate the microbiome in impacting HIV-1 envelope vaccine-induced antibody responses. He also led the first antibody repertoire studies of macaques in infected with simian HIV, uh, known to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies in humans. Wilton has won numerous uh, awards for his scholarship, including numerous outstanding young investigator awards, which the length uh, of this would take too much time to list each, every, each and every one. Uh, if you have any questions for Wilton, uh, please type this into the chat box and I will address these at the end of this talk. Wilton, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Tim, for that kind introduction. So for my talk today, I will describe a structural category of natural antibodies that we refer to as fabdamerized glycan reactive antibodies or FDG antibodies for short. So this is a problem that I'm studying. Many pathogens have high mannose glycans on their surfaces, for example, HIV-1, SARS-CoV-2, that's responsible for the current pandemic, and fungal pathogens such as yeast. Therefore, glycans are key targets for anti-pathogen antibodies. However, high mannose glycans are also on host molecules, thus the induction of antibodies targeting these pathogen high mannose glycans have been postulated to be controlled by host tolerance mechanisms. So here I'm showing you a schematic of the glycosylated HIV-1 envelope trimer. This trimer sits on the surface of the virion and mediates entry into target cells. On the left of the slide is a top view of the trimer, and on the right is a side view of the trimer. So the gray surfaces represent the envelope peptide backbone, and the different colored spheres indicate the potential end-link glycosylation sites. Now, the green spheres are the potential end-link glycosylation sites that are occupied with a glycan 75 to 100% of the time. The yellow spheres are the sites that are occupied with a glycan 25 to 75% of the time. And the purple spheres represent like our sites that are occupied with a glycan less than 25% of the time. So as you can see from both the top and side views that the HIV-1 envelope is densely glycosylated as it has these potential end link glycosylation sites that are generally um, occupied. The SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is also glycosylated. And here's a schematic of the glycosylated SARS-CoV-2 spike that sits on the coronavirus um, or the that sits on the coronavirus and mediates entry into target cells. So again, the gray region is showing you the um, spike peptide backbone. Uh, the different colored regions indicate the potential end-link glycosylation sites that are occupied. Uh, the purple regions, these are occupied less than 29% of the time. The orange regions, these are occupied glycan sites that are occupied 30 to 79% of the time. And the green regions, are the uh, potential end-link glycosylation sites that are occupied 80 to 100% of the time. Now these blue surfaces are, indicate, are indicating the receptor binding um, domain that binds the ACE2 um, on target cells that mediate entry uh, for the coronavirus uh, using the spike protein. Now, as you, the point here though, is that the coronavirus spike protein is also glycosylated. However, it is not as densely glycosylated as the HIV-1 envelope trimer that I just showed you in the previous slide. Now shown on this slide are schematics for end-link glycans that are generated by the host glycosylation machinery. On the left are high mannose glycans that are processed in the endoplasmic reticulum. And on the right are hybrid glycans or complex glycans that are processed in the Golgi. Now you'll notice that all the glycans have an n ac 2 glucosamine groups or, or a couple groups. And these are the blue rectangles found at the base of each glycan. And attached to those n ac 2 glucosamine groups are different um, sugar molecules, whether it's sialic acid, glucose, glucose, galactose, or mannose. 
Now, the antibodies that I'll describe in my talk today bind to this high mannose glycan that's referred to as MAN9, which has nine mannose residues attached to the N-acetylglucosamine groups. Now, you'll also hear me talk about kifenensin. Kifenensin is an enzyme that prevents the processing of MAN9, and it's widely used by researchers to generate recombinant proteins that predominantly express MAN9 glycans. Overall, though, the N-linked glycans and virion-associated HIV-1 envelope trimer and SARS-CoV-2 spike protein are predominantly high mannose forms, including MAN9. Now, the B-cell pool of natural antibodies has also been reported as a source of glycan reactive antibodies. Natural antibodies are pre-existing or immediately responsive immunoglobulins that provide the first line of defense against bacteria, fungal, and viral infections. They suppress autoimmune, inflammatory, and allergic responses. They maintain vascular homeostasis, and they mediate apoptotic cell clearance. They're also generally near germline in sequence and have repertoire skewing of different isotypes, whether they be IgM, IgA, IgG, or IgE. And they can also respond to antigens in a T-independent manner. And natural antibodies bind to glycans. Now, this image that I'm showing you on the right nicely summarizes the characteristics of natural antibodies. In the outer green circle are the different functions of natural antibodies. They have protective roles in protecting from bacteria, viruses, and fungi. The yellow region of the circle represents or indicates the different um, antigens that are bound by these antibodies, including glycoproteins and glycolipids. The red, red circle represents uh, the different isotypes. These include IgG and IgM, IgG here and IgM here. And the innermost circle indicates the different target cells that have been postulated to generate natural antibodies. And these include marginal zone B cells, which we've identified as um, cells that generate envelope glycan reactive antibodies that I'll describe. Now, with this background in mind, the purpose of our study was to study the evolution of the glycan reactive natural B cell repertoire in rhesus macaques and humans using high mannose bearing HIV-1 envelope trimer as the model antigen. These were the outcomes of the study and we published these uh, outcomes in cell um, last year. So first we found that anti-glycan antibodies frequently have dimerized fab regions. They're referred to as fab dimerized glycan or FDG antibodies. And I'll describe that confirmation in the next slide. Second, the FDG antibodies are multipurpose and can be stimulated to become broadly neutralizing antibodies or BNABs in the context of retroviral infection. So these BNABs target conserved sites on different HIV-1 strains. And so they, and because of this, they're able to neutralize geographically different HIV-1 strains and are the targets uh, for an effective HIV-1 vaccine. And I'll describe F, uh, these FDG BNABs in more detail later on in the talk. Now, the precursors of FDG antibodies, unlike the precursors of other HIV-1 BNABs, were common and found to be generated by marginal zone-like B cells. Thus, uh, you know, FDG antibodies are a target for vaccine, or these data would imply that. We also found that fab dimerization can occur by multiple mechanisms, and the fab and, and the FDG antibodies are conserved between rhesus macaques and humans, thus highlighting the ability to study rhesus macaques to learn about human antibodies. Now on the left of this slide is a schematic of your conventional Y-shaped antibody. So here the heavy chains are identical, but colored in red and blue for visualization purposes. The light chain that appears in each heavy chain to form an antigen binding fab arm is shown in orange and cyan. So typically for your conventional Y-shaped antibody, you're gonna have two flexible fab arms, each of which has a single antigen binding site shown by the black star. In panel C on the right, is the schematic for the I-shaped domain swap antibody 2G12. So here, the heavy chain from each fab arm reaches over and carries the light chain of the opposing fab arm to form this rigid I-shaped domain swap antibody. This antibody now is a large paratope for glycan recognition and envelope and other pathogens, as I'll point out later. Now, 2G12 was isolated in the early 1900s and the structure was solved in uh, the early 2000s. Since then, no antibody um, of this type has been reported. More recently, though, we described the non-domain swap I-shaped antibodies shown in panel B in the middle. So here, these antibodies dimerize using heavy chain, heavy chain interactions, and they also have a large pyrotope for glycan recognition and envelope in different glycosylated pathogens. This is a summary of the methods for our study. So first, we performed antigen-specific single B-cell isolation with high mannose dates. Uh, we use a high-throughput um, strategy for, to isolate these B-cells 
and uh, to sort these B cells and isolate the antibodies and also test them for function. I'll describe that strategy in more detail in a few upcoming slides. And this strategy also includes an overlapping PCR antibody assembly, which allows us to generate microgram quantities of IgGs for our initial binding screen. And from that screen, we can identify our best candidate glycan reactive antibodies that we generate in bulk or milligram quantities to test for binding specificities, function, and structure as recombinant monoclonal antibodies. We also perform next generation deep sequencing of immunoglobulin genes to facilitate B cell lineage tracing. And for this study, we studied three cohorts. These were HIV-1 vaccinated rhesus macaques, HIV-1 naive humans, and SHIV infected rhesus macaques. Now the high mannose bearing baits that we use for B cell isolation included HIV-1 envelope trimer and HIV-1 glycopeptides. The recombinant envelope trimer were either of the wild type form where they express heterogeneous glycans or they were kipinins and treated in the sense that the cells that expressed these um, recombinant proteins were kipinins and treated. So that resulted in a man 9 enrichment on these recombinant proteins. For the HIV-1 glycopeptides, we use synthetic man 9 v 3 that was generated by or developed by Sam Danishevsky and colleagues um, at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute in New York City. And shown on the far right is a schematic for the man 9 v 3 glycopeptide. So this is a linear peptide as a truncated sequence from envelope, HIV-1 envelope that is. It also presents two glycans, uh, which we call N301 and N332. Now the presentation of these glycans in a truncated envelope peptide backbone sequence partially mimics a region of the HIV-1 envelope, which is the high mannose patch that is targeted by 2G12 and other envelope glycan reactive uh, mutualizing antibodies. Now, this is a workflow for the high throughput strategy for isolating and producing recombinant antibodies. So first we use fluorescent activated cell sorting or fax. Uh, this basically flow cytometry based approaches to sort individual cell or single cells into individual wells of a nine to six well plate. We use PCR based approaches to amplify the antibody heavy and light chain genes. We can also, we also sequence the genes to get gene information. This includes CDR length, mutation frequency, and other gene information. We then, up, then use our overlapping PCR assembly pipeline to clone these amplicons into linear cassettes. These linear cassettes are then used to transfect cells in a six well plate. And the supernatants from, the, from, from each of these wells will contain microgram quantities of IgG that we can screen for binding or neutralization. Generally, we have enough to give us um, first to allow us to screen these IgGs for binding. And so we use this as our initial screening um, tool to identify our candidate uh, or best omelet black and reactive antibodies that we generate in bulk for additional uh, functional and structural studies. Now, shown in this slide is the immunization schedule for rhesus macaques with high mannose glycopeptide immunogens. So four animals received escalating doses of monomeric man 9 b 3 followed by a single dose of the multimeric form of man 9 b 3 On the top left is a schematic for the monomeric man 9 b 3 glycopeptide. I showed you this earlier. So this is a truncated envelope peptide sequence presenting two glycans referred to as N301 and N332. And this glycan configuration in the, comp in the context of this envelope peptide sequence partially mimics the high mannose patch present an HIV-1 envelope trimer that is a target of 2G12 and other neutralizing envelope glycan reactive antibodies that I'll show you. On the top right is the schematic for the multimeric form of man 9 b 3 and this is a linear copolymer with multiple copies of man 9 b 3 attached. Interestingly, we isolate a clonal lineage of glycan reactive B cells at two time points. This is at week 26, following the, lab, the final um, monomeric man 9 b 3 Oh, not the final, but the fifth monomeric man 9 v 3 glycopeptide immunization, and also after the multimeric form of man 9 v 3 immunization. Now shown in this slide are representative sort plots um, showing the envelope glycan reactive B cells at week 26, this is after the mon monomeric man 9 v 3 glycopeptide, as well as week 73, this is after the multimeric form of the man 9 v 3 um, immunization. And so basically you can see you know, you can appreciate a slight increase or almost twice um, in double the increase in frequency for the envelope glycan reactive B cells that are present at week 73 versus week 26, demonstrating that there is a, there's a vaccine induced response 
that's um, being triggered uh, um, by uh, in this repertoire, basically. And we you know these are candidate on the black and reactive B cells that we think are driven by the vaccine given the increased frequency over time while in different immunizations. Now we then use our high throughput strategy to study these B cells and isolate the antibodies and characterize them for binding specificities and function. Interestingly, we isolated a four member glycan reactive antibody lineage referred to as DH717 lineage from the HIV-1 immunized rhesus macaques. We found that the DH717 lineage antibodies were predominantly IgM isotype. They bound high mannose barren man 9 v 3 glycopeptide, candida albicans glycans, and free high mannose glycans, including man 9 they also demonstrated glycan-dependent neutralization of HIV-1 strains. Importantly, though, they neutralized only the HIV strains with MAN9 enriched glycans. So these would be um, pseudotype viruses or pseudotype HIV-1 viruses with um, envelope bearing MAN9 enriched glycans that is following the kiffinance and treatment of cells expressing these recombinant proteins that get uh, put on the uh, surface of the virion for our studies in vitro. Shown on this slide are 2D class averages from negative state electron microscopy of two of the uh, DH717 lineage antibodies, DH717.1 at the top and DH717.2 at the bottom. So each black square represents a 2D class average of several antibodies um, within a single antibody prep that has the same conformation. The letter I indicates I-shaped antibodies and the letter Y indicates the Y-shaped antibodies. So the red arrow points to the FAB portion of an I-shaped antibody, while the blue arrow points to the FC portion of that same um, I-shaped antibody. And the point here is that we find that the DH717 lineage antibodies have a mix of I and Y-shaped antibody species within a single antibody prep. So I showed you this schematic on the left earlier with the tr traditional Y-shaped antibody as having two flexible FAB arms, each of which have a single antigen binding site. And then in panel B on the right is the I-shaped non-domain swap antibody. This is DH717, for example, that I showed you where this antibody dimerizes using heavy chain, heavy chain interactions. In fact, the um, structural biology team here at the Duke Human Vaccine Institute solved the crystal structure for the DH717.15 dimer. And they found that these antibodies dimerize using a disulfide bond formed between cis free cysteine residues in position 74 in the heavy chain of both um, FAB monomers. We go on to show that if we disrupt this disulfide bond, then the antibodies lose biological activity as well as functions. So next we ask the question, what is the ontogeny of glycan reactive DH717 lineage antibodies? Now to answer this question, we use next generation deep sequencing on the Illumina platform to interrogate the B cell lineages prior to high mannose and glycopeptide immunization in the packs. Interestingly, we found four additional clonally related heavy chain genes of the H717 B cell lineages prior to infection. Strikingly, these were IgM isotype but somatically mutated, thus raising the hypothesis that glycan reactive DH717 antibodies were derived from a pre existing B cell response initiated by high mannose and environmental antigens. Shown in this slide are ELISA binding data for DH717 lineage antibodies binding to Candida albicans yeast. On the x-axis is antibody concentration, and the y-axis is binding antibody levels. Now the black curve represents the recombinant antibody bearing the computationally inferred DH717 unmutated common ancestor or near germline genes. The gray curve represents the recombinant antibody bearing the DH717 clonally related week zero IgM um, heavy chain gene. The different colored curves indicates the IgM and IgG antibodies that were isolated following immunization. And as you can see, there's minimal binding by the DH717 UCA. There's some level of binding detected by the weak zero antibody, but much better binding by the IgM and IgG antibodies that were isolated following immunization. So these data demonstrated that MAN9B3 glycopeptide affinity matured a pre-existing yeast reactive antibody response to the glycans present on yeast. These are similar data, but now I'm showing you binding of DH717 lineage antibodies to man 9 b 3 glycopeptide. Here we see no binding by the DH717 UCA antibody that's following background subtraction. There's detectable binding by the week zero antibodies, and again, much better binding by the antibodies isolated post um, immunization. So these data demonstrated affinity maturation of DH717 antibodies to man 9 b 3 glycopeptide. 
you will also notice that the one IgG um, antibody had similar or lower or weaker binding responses compared to the IgM antibodies. And this we think is suggestive of this lineage maturing in a T cell independent manner. Now, given that we were able to isolate mutated IgM clonal relatives of FEG antibodies prior to immunization in HIV-1 naive macaques, we next asked the question, what is the status of FEG antibodies in HIV-1 naive humans? So here we probe the repertoire of all group glycan reactive antibodies in HIV-1 naive humans using HIV-1 envelope trimers and MAN9V3 glycopeptide as baits for CD19 positive B cell isolation. The criteria for envelope glycan reactive antibodies included binding to MAN9V3 glycopeptide, but not a glycan B3 peptide, binding to yeast antigens, and the more, antibody, more mature antibodies would have a mixture of Y and I-shaped conformations. Using these criteria, we found that envelope glycan reactive antibodies existed at a frequency of one in approximately 340,000 B cells. So here we studied nine individuals, a uh, total of 13 million B cells from those nine individuals, and found 37 glycan reactive antibodies in five of those individuals. The pie chart shown on the left of this slide nicely summarizes the heavy chain genes used by the 37 envelope glycan reactive antibodies. You see they use a variety of heavy chain genes but the dominant ones were VH3-23 and VH1-46 at around 20%. And these genes are used in the human B cell repertoire at a frequency of five to 10%. On the right, the pie chart nicely summarizes the light chain genes that are used by these 37 glycan reactive antibodies. Again, they use a variety of light chain genes, but the dominant one was V kappa 2-24. In fact, V kappa 2-24 is used, used at a frequency of 46%. This is in contrast with less than 1% of the B cell repertoire in humans using um, this gene. And for our B cell repertoire analysis, we studied basically 77,000 paired heavy and light chain genes from three individuals that uh, were publicly available from Dukowski's um, paper in 2015. Now shown in this slide is a table that lists the immunogenetics for seven of our representative recombinant uh, HIV-1 envelope glycan reactive antibodies, or these were the seven antibodies that we generated in bulk to assess the binding specificities, function, and structure. You'll see that they use different heavy chains, mainly 1-46. They primarily use B kappa 2-24. You'll also notice that they have relatively short HCDR3 length, and this is characteristic of um, natural antibodies, which are typically germline-like. Um, given the fact that they have few to no non-templated non nucleotides in their rearrangements. These antibodies were also mutated, whether they were IgM or IgG3. Now the mutated IgM suggests that these antibodies are derived from a pool of IgM memory or marginalzone like B cells. Now for the next two slides, I'll give you an idea of uh, the properties and functions of one of these recombinant antibodies. This is DH1005 shown in the yellow shading or IgG3 antibody here that we actually found to neutralize HIV-1 viruses. So we found that the DH1005 antibody isolated from an HIV-1 naive human to bind MAN9B3 glycopeptide, but not a glycon B3 peptide. This antibody also bound Candida albicans yeast glycans, and they neutralized HIV or, or heterologous HIV strains, but only the strains bearing the MAN9 enriched envelope. And they also have a mixture, of, and this antibody also had a mixture of I and Y-shaped antibody conformations within a single antibody prep. So you'll see that these characteristics were similar to the glycan reactive antibodies isolated from HIV-1 naive macaques, immunized with high mannose bearing MAN9B3 glycopeptide. Here are the 2D class averages from NSCM for DH1005 antibody. And again, you see a mixture of the, the I-shaped antibodies where you have the FAB timer indicated by the arrow here and the FC a uh, portion of that antibody indicated by this other um, white arrow. And then on the right, you have the um, Y-shaped antibodies. So again, you have a mix of both I and Y-shaped antibody species within a single antibody prep, similar to what we saw with the vaccine-induced DH717 lineage antibodies. Now, at this point, we were struck by the fact that the HIV-1 envelope glycan reactive antibodies with the FAB dimerized conformation that were isolated from HIV-1 immunized rhesus macaques and naive humans Share, had shared properties with known HIV-1 envelope glycan reactive broadly neutralizing antibody 2G12 that I mentioned earlier. Now, before I go into the history of um, 2G12, I just wanted to remind you of the um, 
complex processes that are involved in generating the traditional Y-shaped antibody. So the experts in this area uh, can spend an entire hour um, for a seminar to describe these processes. But the point I want to make is that we have a complex um, set of, of assembly and folding processes that involve, fold, you know, basically cold translation of me mechanism that involve uh, folding, disulfide bridge formation and glycosylation. And this all results in your typical traditional Y-shaped antibody that uh, is exported from the and the plasma reticulum. However, Previous um, studies have isolated a fabdamerized I-shaped antibody 2G12 that targeted glycans on h 1 on the glycoprotein. And this I-shaped antibody confirmation was due to domain swapping of the heavy and light chain genes that I remind you of that scheme um, confirmation on the next slide. Um, 2G12 antibody was isolated from pooled peripheral blood cells of multiple hiv one infected individuals. This is over 26 years ago. So the ontogeny of 2G12 has remained unknown. Now, interestingly, there are mouse B cell lines that have been generated that um, have been shown to uh, present mature 2G12 expressed as a domain swap form um, of the BCR, thus demonstrating that this domain swapping is not an artifact of in vitro expression, but it actually happens in vivo. Again, on the left of this slide is a schematic for the Y-shaped antibody with two flexible fab arms, each of which presents a single bind antigen binding site. In the middle in panel B is the I-shaped non-domain swap antibody where there is dimerization by heavy chain, heavy chain um, interactions. And I've shown you DH717 that was elicited by the HIV-1 vaccine in rhesus macaques. And then DH1005 that was isolated from an HIV-1 naive individual. These are both examples of the I-shaped non-domain swap antibody. And 2G12 though is on the right. This is an I-shaped domain swap antibody. So here, the heavy chain from one fab arm again reaches over and carries the light chain of the opposing fab arm to form this rigid I-shaped domain swap antibody. Now the structure of 2G12 have also been solved, and this is a cryo-EM structure of 2G12 of fab dimer in complex with the combinant HIV1 envelope trimer. So the trimer is represented by the gray uh, surface, um, right, the gray region of uh, the structure of the figure. And then the 2G12 fab dimer is shown in cyan and purple. A zoomed in view is shown on the right. And here you can basically see a crossover of the heavy chain from one fab arm reaching over and peering the light chain of the opposing fab arm. So the point here is that um, cryo EM structural analysis is appropriate for visualizing this crossover or this domain swapping of 2G12. Now, given that 2G12 was isolated from a chronic um, HIV-1 infection, um, in chronically HIV-1 infected individual, we next ask the question, can we find FDG broadly neutralizing antibodies or BNABs in the setting of retrovirus infection in rhesus macaques? And we wondered whether it would be a domain swap antibody like 2G12, or would they also be non-domain swap like DH717 or DH1005? And I'll go on to show you that there are non-domain swap antibodies like DH717 and DH1005. Now, before I show you those data, I would like to briefly go over the background of HIV-1 algorithm BNABs and the rhesus macaque model that we use to study these FDG BNABs. So shown on this slide is an image that uh, basically nicely shows the, or depicts the um, HIV-1 envelope trimer that sits on the surface of the virion and mediates entry to target cells. So the HIV-1 envelope trimer is made up of three GP120 and GP41 heterodimer. The blue surfaces indicate the GP120 portion of the protein the um, light brown or beige surface of the base of the, or the, at the base of the trimer indicates the GP41 portion of um, the trimer. Now, GP41 is a membrane-bound protein, and the portion of GP41 that's not yet been crystallized is shown by these cartoons. Now, the different colored um, regions on the trimer, shown in uh, purple, orange, red, and green, represents broadly neutralizing antibody uh, epitopes or sites. So these are sites that are generally conserved on the trimer across different HIV-1 um, strains. And antibodies that target any of these sites um, can generally neutralize several different geographical HIV-1 strains, hence the term broadly neutralizing antibodies. And they're also the targets uh, for an effective HIV-1 vaccine. Now, 2G12 targets gly only glycans that are, are present around this B3 glycan BNAT site. I showed you this um, image earlier or figure earlier with the glycosylated HIV-1 envelope trimer. And here I just want to point out that 2G12 targets this high mannose patch on envelope 
So this I minus patch is made up of four glycans at um, envelope position 295, 332, 339, and 392. Now this high mannose patch is believed to be unique to HIV and is conserved across different HIV-1 isolates. So the fact that this um, high mannose patch is unique to HIV is what we think contributes to the immunological discrimination by HIV-1 envelope glycan reactive BNAGs like 2G12 rather than 2G12 randomly um, neutralizing every other uh, glycosylated protein, including host proteins. Now, in terms of the MCAT model, SHIV infection model that we used to interrogate the B-cell repertoire of glycan reactive antibodies, this model was informed by previous work done by Bart Haynes and colleagues here at the UK Human Vaccine Institute. So here, Bart Haynes and colleagues have studied several HIV-1 individuals, many of whom generated different um, HIV-1 BNADs. Now, from this one individual, Bart and company was able to isolate a B3 glycan BNAD. They were also able to isolate the virus that uh, established the infection in this person and was responsible for inducing BNAB induction or BNAB um, development. Our collaborator, George Shaw at University of Pennsylvania then modified the envelope from this virus. And this modification was basically done to improve the efficiency of the envelope interaction with rhesus CD4 and rhesus CD4 T cells. <coughs> Excuse me. George then uh, complemented the, the modified CH848 envelope with the SIV um, genes or SIV backbone to generate these simian HIV or what we refer to as pathogenic SHIBs. So here George is able to generate several SHIBs. Um, each one expressed a different envelope or HIV strain. And these are envelopes from different HIV strains that were associated with BNAB induction in, um, the, in HIV-1 infected individuals that were studied by Barkins and company. Now, the two SHIVs that you will hear me mention today are CH848 SHIV and BG505 SHIV. All the SHIVs are pathogenic in that they generated, uh, they led to AIDS uh, in the rhesus macaques. And interestingly, in the CH848 SHIV, there was V3 glycan BNABs that were induced, similarly to V3 glycan BNABs that were induced in the HIV-1 CH848 infected individual, demonstrating that there is conserved or shared mechanisms in um, B cell responses including BNAB induction in these macaque models as well as in um, humans. And these were, data were reported in a paper in Science early last year. Now using high manual in baits, we isolated two clonal lineages of FDG neutralizing antibodies from a pathogenic SHIV that one I mentioned, CH848. Uh, so it's a pathogenic SHIV infected macaque. The two clonal lineages were DH898 and DH851 B cell lineages. Listed on the left of the slide are the characteristics of the DH898 lineage. There are seven antibodies in this lineage. They neutralize the autologous HIV strain only, so that's the HIV strain that was used for the infection. However, they did not neutralize any of 119 geographically diverse HIV-1 strains. And so this is a panel of uh, multi-clade HIV-1 strains that's generally used to assess neutralization breadth of uh, HIV-1 envelope reactive antibodies. Now, these antibodies demonstrated um, the neutralization of the autologous virus using um, HIV-1 envelope glycan, that's N332, which is also present in the high mannose patch target by 2G12 that I mentioned earlier. These antibodies also bind high mannose, including MAN9 and yeast glycans. On the right are the characteristics of the DH851 lineage antibodies. Now, there are four antibodies in this lineage. They neutralized autologous and heterologous HIV strains, hence, the, you know, uh, the suggested that they are broadly neutralizing antibodies. And in fact, they neutralized up to 26% of uh, 119 multi-clade geographically diverse HIV-1 strains. And the neutralization was dependent on HIV glycans, including those present in the high mannose patch target by 2G12. They also bind high mannose and yeast glycans like uh, DH898 and 2G12 antibodies. Now, interestingly, the while the DH898 autologous neutralizing antibody could only neutralize the autologous HIV with heterogeneous glycoforms or glycans, we found that uh, the DH898 antibodies could also neutralize heterologous HIV only if they have MAN9 enriched envelope. The DH851 BNABs, they can neutralize autologous and heterologous uh, HIV strains bearing heterogeneous glycans, hence the categorization of them being um, called BNABs. However, we also find that they have enhanced neutralization potency of HIV with MAN9 enriched envelope. So these data demonstrated regulation of heterologous neutralization to be by glycoform status. 
For example, like I just mentioned, DH898 would only neutralize heterologous HIV isolates when the virus was produced in the presence of uh, kifenensin, which is where the glycans were primarily MAN9. Interestingly, we also isolated a second FDGB NAB lineage from a different ship infected macaque. So here we isolated 42 member B cell lineage just referred to as DH1003. This FDGB NAB lineage was isolated from a BG505 ship infected macaque in addition to DH851 that we isolated from the um, CH848 ship infected macaque. Now these DH1003 antibodies neutralized four of 10 heterologous HIV isolates. This is a smaller panel of difficult to neutralize viruses that are generally used to assess neutralization breadth of HIV-1 um, envelope antibodies. We also found that the neutralization of these heterologous HIV isolates was dependent on glycans, including the glycans present within the high mannerist patch targeted by 2G12. So here I'm showing you, I've shown you two examples for FDG BNABs, DH851 and DH1003, thus demonstrating that these FDG BNAB induction is not a one-off occurrence. Now, like FDG antibodies in HIV-1 naive macaques and humans, we next ask the question, were SHIV-induced DH851 antibodies present prior to infection? Now, to answer this question, again, we use next generation deep sequencing to interrogate the B cell lineages prior to SHIV infection in macaques. And we found multiple clonally related heavy chain sequences or members of DH898 and DH851 lineage prior to infection. Again, interestingly, these um, pre-infection antibodies were predominantly IgM isotype, but somatically mutated, thus raising the hypothesis that DH898 and DH851 lineages were derived from a pre-existing B cell response that was initiated by high manosphere and environmental antigens. Here I'm showing you data of DH851 lineage antibodies binding to candida albicans yeast. I showed you similar graphs, uh, ELISA graphs earlier. Um, here I'm pointing out that the DH851 UCA in the black curve and the cyan curve is a weak zero antibody at modest, if minimal, what we refer to as minimal binding to yeast. However, you see much better binding by the IgM and IgG antibodies that were isolated um, following infection. So these data demonstrated affinity maturation of DH851 antibodies to yeast and suggested that glycan bearing environmental antigens may prime DH851 like precursor B cells. Here are similar data, but now I'm showing you binding of DH851 lineage antibodies to the recombinant HIV1 envelope trimer. That's the uh, autologous envelope trimer. That's the trimer present on the virion that was used for infection. And again, we see minimal binding by DH851 UCA, better binding, but still modest uh, by week zero antibody, but much better binding by the antibodies that were isolated following infection. So these data demonstrated affinity maturation of DH851 antibodies to an HIV1 envelope trimer. Here we also noticed that the IgM antibody, in this case, had weaker binding responses compared to the more mature IgG antibodies that were isolated uh, following um, infection. So these are, this is more classical of what we referred to as the T cell dependent um, maturation B cell pathway for this antibody lineage. Here I'm showing you 2D class averages from NSEM of DH851 antibody at the top and 2G12 antibody at the bottom. And again, the point here is that the DH851 antibody by looking at the 2D class averages, you can see a mix of both Y and I-shaped antibodies within a single antibody prep. In contrast, for the 2G12 antibody, we see only I-shaped uh, antibodies. The structural biology team here at the Human Vaccine Institute also saw the cryo structure of DH851 IgG BNAB in the fab that's in complex with the uh, HIV and all trimer. So the trimer is represented in gray and the fab dimer in cyan and purple and in black are the glycans. Shown in the middle, we basically is an image that demonstrates that we see a gap between the heavy chains of both fabs, demonstrating that this um, antibody does not domain swap. And we were also able to identify some of the glycans that were targeted um, by the DH851 IgG BNAB. And these include glycans within the high mannerist patch targeted by 2G12. So in summary, these data raise the hypothesis that FDG antibodies constitute a category of uh, HIV-1 envelope glycan reactive neutralizing antibodies. Previous studies have shown that 2G12 UCA and the intermediate do, uh, do not domain swap. Uh, the UCA does not bind glycans and does not bind candida albicans, also doesn't bind HIV-1 envelope and doesn't neutralize HIV, whether HIV 
bearing envelope with um, MAN9 enriched glycan or heterogeneous glycans. The 2G12 intermediate, on the other hand, binds glycans and candida albicans. For the mature 2G12, we see that this antibody is domain swap, binds glycans, candida albicans, uh, and HIV in envelope. It also, it also neutralizes HIV, whether HIV bearing envelope with heterogeneous glycoforms or primarily man, high mannose glycan like MAN9. In terms of the antibodies that I've described um, in, my, in our study, we um, have DH1005 from the HIV1 naive individual. We have antibodies from the vaccinated macaque and shiv infected macaques. Um, in a, and this also includes DH1003 from macaque shiv infection. You see that none of them are domain swap. However, they bind glycans, candida albicans, and HIV1 envelope. They also all neutralize HIV bearing MAN9 enriched envelope but only a few examples like DH851 and DH1003 that I mentioned earlier can neutralize HIV bearing um, envelope with heterogeneous glycans, so, which is similar to what we've seen in 2G12. Now, I showed you earlier that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein was also glycosylated, although it was less densely glycosylated as HIV and envelope trimer. So we tested our FDG antibodies for binding to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and found that they actually bind a quaternary um, epitope or glycodominated quaternary epitope on the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. What I'm showing you on this slide is a cryo-EM structure from Primvad and colleagues here that um, uh, performed the cryo-EM structure analysis for our work of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein on the left with the FD 2G12 um, fab dimer um, bound to it shown in the bottom right on this um, image here on the left. But on the far right, this, this is a zoomed in view of the 2G12 fab dimer. And what you're looking at is the basically showing that the domain swapping um, confirmation can be visualized using prior EM. Again, you see that the um, heavy chain from one fab arm in black reaches over and pairs the light chain of the opposing um, fab arm in red. Shown at the top of this slide is the um, <clears throat> genomic organization for the S1 and S2 uh, subunits of the SARS CoV 2 spike protein. And these little tree-like um, figures or sticks are basically representing different uh, potential N-linked glycosylation sites. And I'll show you that the FDG antibodies target this uh, quaternary epitope of three glycans at position 709, 717, and 801. So this is the cryo-EM structure of 2G12 BNAB in complex with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Again, so here you're looking at the um, 2G12 fab dimer in the ribbon configuration. And then the glycans on the spike are shown uh, in purple and uh, green. And on the right here is just a different view of the same interaction. So in summary, we've isolated I-shaped, fab dimerized, glycan reactive or FDG antibodies in the B-cell repertoire of both rhesus macaques and humans. We found that FDG antibodies were common. They were present at a frequency of one in 340,000 B-cells in humans. This is um, a magnitude of or this is basically uh, orders of magnitude better than um, the HIV-1 envelope broadly neutralizing antibodies that use long HCDR3 to buy mediate contact with the envelope peptide backbone. Those have been reported at frequencies in one in several million. Now, FDG antibodies also have heterologous uh, HIV-1 neutralization breadth. And here we see that the heavy chain domain swapping is not required for neutralization breadth at 2G12. Additionally, we find that FDG antibodies have heterogeneous glycan binding motifs, the HIV-1 envelope. These include hetero, um, hydrophobic interactions, sorry, and um, uh, disulfide bonds, like I showed you for the H717 in the vaccine-induced antibodies. Many of these antibodies bound to SARS-CoV-2, and I showed you the crystal structure for 2G12 in complex with SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And they also bound well to candida species, including candida albicans and the highly pathogenic candida auris that I didn't have time to show you. In conclusion, we've identified a common mode of HIV-1 envelope recognition to be by non-domain swapped fab dimerized glycan reactive antibodies. A major question is if the IgMB cells primed by high mannosphere and environmental antigens such as yeast may undergo affinity maturation in the setting of retroviral infection to DNAP status. I've also shown you that FDG BNAVs were induced by HIV infection, as in the case of 2G12 that was previously reported, and we found DH851 and DH1003 that were um, induced or listed by SHIB infection in the cats.
These data also raise the hypothesis that DH717 antibodies are FDG precursors that were expanded by vaccination in the past. In terms of future studies, again, a major question is if the IgM D cell pool of onboard glycan reactive antibodies can be recruited for broadly neutralizing antibody generation by vaccines to attack the HIV or SARS CoV 2 glycan shields. Uh, to answer this question, we're collaborating with Dr. Kevin Saunders here at Duke, who's working in candidate immunogens, and uh, Dr. Fred Alt at Harvard, who's generating different mouse models expressing uh, BCRs for these 2G12 UCA and precursor FDG antibodies. We're also interested um, in isolating and characterizing FDG antibodies from marginal zone B cells that are abundant in children and young macaques. And the point here is if we can find FDG antibodies in the marginal zone of children in pediatric populations um, that can respond to HIV antigens, then we have plenty of time to mature these B cells over time to become effective neutralizing antibodies by targeting glycan on HIV. Um, and this is a an important point for pediatric populations in the sense that by we have enough time to mature these lineages prior to sexual debut. So again, the point, uh, an important point here is that these uh, data will provide a target for appropriate therapies to harness and mature these B cells in response to glycans and pathogens in pediatric subjects. If um, this uh, study can come to fruition where we can isolate and characterize these FEG antibodies from marginal zone B cells. And I have a grant on the review for this. So. Hopefully there are any reviewers on the uh, call. They're more happy to ask me any questions and um, I can address them for um, that person. Now, this is the this is a, a FDG team. Uh, that's, that's of course myself on the left, Primvada Acharya. She's a director for structural biology here at Duke Human Vaccine Institute and uh, governed all the um, prior EM structures. RJ Edwards did all the um, NSCM work and also a member of the structural biology team here at Duke Human Vaccine Institute. And then there was Ryan Meyerhoff, who was a grad student at the time working with uh, Bart Haynes, and he led the um, vaccination, the macaque vaccination effort to isolate DH717. So I'd like to end by acknowledging several members of the Duke Human Vaccine Institute that, were, that is led by Barton Haynes, who was also the senior author on this study, um, several members of my lab, um, different collaborators, whether here at Duke or off-site, and also our funding agencies, to which we are entirely grateful. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll take any questions. Thank you so much for that fantastic seminar, Wilton. Um, I have a few questions to, to start us off. Um, so maybe I missed this, but I'm curious about what, what is it about the eye shape or the domain swap that is there, are there selective advantages to that structural confirmation? Absolutely. Yeah, but absolutely. So these um, eye shape form, eye shape form of antibodies are generated due to uh, mutations, selecting those basically, um, because what we've seen is in the case of DH717, um, or not even just that one, but in the case of dh 51 BNAP, there's an IgM form that does not domain shop, does not domain swap, it's in the Y-shaped conformation, but the IgG forms that are more mutated, they're in the uh, I-shaped form, and we are able to make mutations that can disrupt these um, dimerizations uh, between or dimerizations for the I-shaped antibodies. We also see evidence for somatic hypermutation leading to dimerization in the case of DH717. So that antibody dimerizes using a free cysteine at position 74 in the heavy chain performance disulfide bond. But in the DH717 UCA and in majority of the heavy chain genes in the B-cell repertoire, it's really a, cyst a serine at that position. So this cysteine um, is a result of a mutation that leads to this dimerization. Now, uh, one of the strengths of the dimerization is the high affinity or avidity for binding the high mannose patch on HIV1 envelope. So if you think about it, it's a circular conformation of four glycans. The typical Y-shaped antibody would be able to bind, but it wouldn't be able to bind as effective as an I-shaped antibody that can lock into that patch in more of a um, lock and key mechanism to facilitate effective um, glycan interaction and neutralization of HIV. So that's really the um, key for the dimerization. Gotcha. And and is there is there further structural like advantages for the domain swap versus just an eye shape confirmation, or is that is that known? Well, the, the structural advantage would be the envelope glycan recognition or just the glycan recognition in different patches. Um, because typically, you know, the antibody is going to want to exist in a Y shape confirmation. That's the lowest energy. 
So in order for it to dimerize, it has to have a reason for doing so. And uh, it has to have like a, a benefit uh, for that. And this we think at this point is based on the glycan, the glycan interactions in different pathogens. Perfect. Um, I also had a follow-up question for you. So the the sort of high mannose binding glycans, right? Is the half-life of those glycoproteins greater than other sort of like antigens present in germinal centers? That I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we've not we've not really looked at um, half-life of the you know the B cells that respond to the glycosylated proteins. Um, whether they're going to be in the germinal center longer or outside of the germinal center. Now, what we do know is, you know, I showed you evidence for the DH717 lineage antibodies where the IgM and IgGs were binding equally well. As a matter of fact, it looked like the IgMs were binding better than the IgG. So that would be a classic, classical example of the um, extra follicular maturation pathway where it's not involved in germinal center versus the DH851 antibody lineage in SHIV infection, the IgGs actually dimerize, they can neutralize autologous and heterologous HIV, but the IgM doesn't dimerize and it can only neutralize HIV with the MAN9 enriched envelope. So that's an um, example that we think of a, one of these FDG lineages that may have participated in the germinal center. Um, there, the literature suggests that uh, these natural antibodies can participate in both T cell dependent and T cell independent um, mechanisms. Um, there are also some evidence that uh, they can start in the marginal zone and then migrate to the germinal center and back and forth. So in order to figure out really where, what's the pathway for these lineages, we would certainly need to do a lot more lineage tracing, looking at the um, marginal zone in the spleen, um, germinal center and lymph nodes and blood and look for these different isotypes and these different antibodies. And perhaps, uh, you know, use studies where we can trace the man 9 vp glycopeptide and see if it stays in the ger germinal center um, versus, and, and the le length of time for which it's there um, versus if it's only outside of the germinal center. But we think it's a mixture of both. Excellent. Um, okay, so I think what we'll do is if, if anyone has any questions for Wilton, um, they can just type that onto the YouTube channel a little bit later. A lot of our audience watches uh, later uh, the recording. Okay. And if you can monitor that and answer any questions you have, um, that'd be great. So thanks everyone for joining us. Wilton, thanks for the fantastic talk. Um, and we'll save everyone next time. Thank you for having me. Take care.